All right, hello everyone, Simon here, and we have our second submission for our ArcMind 100 exercises. So uh, this is by Icewind Hunter, he calls himself, also known as Harris. Before we do anything else, let me just have a quick glance. Oh, let me have a quick glance at his work, and we'll just see what uh, initial comments we might make. I was looking at this a little bit earlier. It seems it's very rectangular in some ways, very geometric too. But I mean, Minecraft is rectangular, so it's not really a. It's not necessarily him, right? <laughs> but that's cool. Look at that garden there. Look at look at the geometry and the labyrinth and the uh, lake and the uh, everything else. That's cool. Uh, looking forward to looking at that. And then the garden, we see some circles and uh, a few curving paths, and then geometry as well. So it's a lot of rectangles here, which is maybe uh, his kind of thing. Looks good to me. What else do we have? I think that's pretty much it. All right, let's go on and uh, see what he has to say. So in the message that he sent to me on YouTube, he says, My name is Harris. I've been following your channel for a couple of years. Recently, I've been doing the ArcMind 101 exercises, 100 exercises, after watching your videos. I am not in any way trained in architecture. My profession is completely different and unrelated to it. But I do have a lot of interest in architecture since I started watching TV shows about architecture. I even bought the textbook Architecture, Form, Space and Order by Francis D.K. Ching to formally familiarize myself with this field. That, by the way, is an excellent book. Uh, if you don't know what it is, it is Arch Architecture, Form, Space and Order by Francis D.K. Ching. It's a great book. So Francis, he, he, he draws well. And so the book is basically his drawings and then his explanations of different architectural concepts. It's just a great book to, to understand concepts, right, about architecture. So if you, if, you, if you want to buy a book about architecture to kind of learn the basics, you should buy that book. That's a great book. Uh, he says, all right, the link to his file, and he says, I have included written books in the inventory. All right, that's the stuff that I'm holding right now. Uh, he also says, I am happy for you to share the download link to my save with your viewers. Thanks for reviewing my submission. All right, that's awesome. So I'll put the link to his file download in the uh, video description if you want to download it and have a look at it. So let's go through his exercises. It looks pretty, uh, it was good. It was good. But geometries. So the statue is a horse. Um, hmm. The horse is well fed. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if the horse's proportions are. Although to be honest, I don't often look at a horse from underneath, so maybe it, horses really do look like that. The side view is uh, pretty good. When we look at a statue, we want to look at it from all angles, right, to see uh, how we feel about it. Curious. All right, it looks pretty good. It looks pretty good. Let's see what he has to say. Uh, town statue, a uh, horse statue, all right. I settled on a horse for its elegance and beauty so that town visitors would subconsciously be reminded of these values whenever they see the statue. Interesting. Horses are quite beautiful animals. Like They're, they're very efficient at being a horse, if that makes sense. <laughs> like They're very good at running and, and stuff. Despite being technically more challenging to build, I pictured a wearing horse as I wanted to a form that conveyed motion and energy. That's good. I chose the white quartz to suggest purity as well as giving the statue contrast from the plinth. I started on the sideways silhouette to give its basic shape. From there I added bulk and sculpted the statue until it became the finished product. Getting the shape right from every angle was difficult, and it is. It is usually quite difficult. But that's kind of, that's the challenge of the exercise, right? To kind of think about things in 3D. Because when you look at things in a picture, it's just 2D, and it's 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 not easy to translate that into a 3D form, and, and that's the challenge, and it's good that you were challenged by that. Uh, but I believe I got the desired result. I hit the lights on the statue where they can't be viewed from the ground. My only gripe is that it's probably too big, but still within the plinth boundary. I needed the statue to look like the source photo, and in the process unintentionally made it into its current scale. After I finish the build, I worry that it will tower over other buildings. Do you think it sits too big next to other buildings, especially so close to the town square? 
In a way, I think its large size is somewhat offset by the use of similar material in the temple. So there's less contrast between adjacent builds. That is true. Overall, I'm happy with this build considering this is the first time I've ever constructed a statue of an organic shape, more so an animal statue. Well, it's good to hear that this is the first time you try this. First of all, you did a really good job. It looks really good. And secondly, hey, learning new things. So is it too big? It is. I mean, if you compare it to real life statues, it is quite large. But that's because like there's, there's not many large statues in real life because they're expensive and they're difficult to make. So um, I guess it's, it's not, not quite as big as the Statue of Liberty. What other comparable statues are there? Not that many. It is, I mean, if you, if you think about it in comparison to real world statues, it is a little bit large. Compared to other buildings, it's all right. It's all right. I don't, I don't see a huge problem with it. I mean, it, it's large. But if you just stand here, for example, you look around, it seems, no, it, it seems all right. Yeah, it, it seems all right. I don't think that's, that's, that's a big problem. So he started with the profile, and you can kind of tell too that like this view of the horse is maybe the best view of it. I still think it's a little fat in the body. Like I think it's, it's a little bit wide, although it looks okay here. Maybe the belly is a little bit wide. It seems to me like the belly is a little bit wide. Maybe if we kind of cut that back a little bit, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But you know, as, as we said, it's very difficult to make a thing in 3D, especially if you're making it out of blocks, as you are in Minecraft. So everything is square anyway. I think you did a really good job. I think that's a really good job, especially for a first attempt at a statue. Hopefully uh, it's been an interesting experience. It's entirely white. The thing about that, of course, is that if it's a lot of there's a lot of clouds, you might lose the shape of it against the white clouds. But I'm imagining it's going to look really good at night time. What if I go time set night? Interesting. Interesting. Hmm. Um. Actually, what about the direction of it? The thing is, if we decide that the profile, like this, if we decide that the side view of the horse is the uh, is the best view of it, maybe that's the view that you should present to the town square, because it's like it's rearing at you, like it's coming towards you. But you, I mean, I think, and you also just said that the side view is in fact the best view of it. So maybe if you just turn it. So it faces the other way, maybe that would actually make more sense because you want to present the, the best view towards the town square where most people would be. Wouldn't that be... Wouldn't that make more sense? I mean, <laughs> it's too late now, you already built it, unless you want to rebuild it. But it seems like this is the best view, right? I mean, I hope you... I think this is the best view, and so maybe if, if that view is what you present to here, so you just kind of turn it around. 90 degrees, maybe that would make more sense. Ah, that's alright, it's not a big deal. Not a huge deal. Okay, so the second exercise is the shops. Before we look at the book, let's just see. So we got a... like a, a hut, or a cabin, on one side, and then this really modern looking... Oh, he's put villagers in here, interesting. And this really modern looking, like a department store kind of a design over here. I like the colors too, the the, the gray and the uh, and the white. I like the color scheme. They complement each other quite well. All right, let's see what he has to say about this. Uh, exercise two: shops, cafe, and department store. So he says, starting with the cafe, the furniture layout appears to suggest an outdoor area of the building. Going along this line of thinking, I wanted a smooth transition between indoor and outdoor, even blurring the line between these two if possible. This is reflected in the open threshold into the outdoor area with a horizontal line of glass blocks to allow greater line of sight between the two areas. Let me just look at this stuff as we read. So he says, uh, 
indoor to outdoor, horizontal, is that what it means? The horizontal, oh that! Horizontal glass blocks there. I see, so he's made it so that... It's like, you know, it, it seems like it's open, right? It seems like these aren't actual walls, although there's glass. But the fact that he's made it glass, it looks like there's kind of nothing. I get it, I get it, I do see it. Like, it, it seems like it's just a... like a porch. And there's, there's no indoors or outdoors. And there's no, I mean, there's literally no door here, so I guess that's actually true. Alright, let's see what he has to say. I aimed to have the indoor area to have a similar open quality to it, plus the abundance of windows and the skylight. Even though a skylight is easier to achieve in Minecraft with a flat roof, I opted for a gable roof to give the building some verticality, both to give an experience of relative spaciousness when indoor, and to balance the building against the taller store next to it. Sounds good? The outdoor area faces the town square and the surrounding buildings, as I think these are more interesting than the small harbour. Moving on... Okay, before we go to the department store, let's see what he says about that. Alright, so he's decided to face them towards the town square, and it is facing the town square, so this is kind of nice. So if you're kind of sitting here, enjoying your meal, then, then you get this kind of view outside. Uh, here we're facing the, the harbour, that's okay too. And he says he's opted for a... oh, I see. So the roof slopes, even with a skylight up there. See, this is cool. It is, it is quite bright in here, right? There's a lot of light and uh, a nice tall ceiling so that you feel like you're in an open space and there's a pig staring at me. Yeah, I, I see it. I see it. It works. It is uh, open and spacious. Okay, moving on to the department store. Uh, moving on to the department store, I used red as a color accent to prevent it from looking too boring. I wanted to limit the first floor area within the middle to the building only. Wait a minute. I wanted to limit the first floor area within the middle to the building only, so it doesn't tower over the cafe. Oh, I see. So the uh, so he he's made the side bits single story, and then only the the middle bit is is double story, so that he. So that the entire thing is not too tall. Using the same acacia wood for roof trimming serves to shorten the building further by sandwiching the wall. Yes, and if you go back to outside, you can see that the the horizontal lines are really emphasized, so that you know you kind of he's, he's he's using the horizontal lines to push down the building and not not make it look too tall. Inside the use of inside the use of mini windows create the sense of wider space on the ground floor. I created an open office on the first floor without any walls to give a view to the ground floor as well as to the outside. Then I realized that the noise from the ground floor may distract office workers upstairs. I closed it up, but I'm not particularly happy with the look as well as having the view to the outside obscured. So I reverted back to the original. Alright, trying things out. Do you have any suggestions on creating a physical separation while allowing workers, of the, allowing the office workers to enjoy the view? Hmm. Well, let me just go back and see what he says. So, he used the horizontal lines, on like the horizontal roof lines, to uh, to you know bracket the the building and not make it look too tall. That's good. Let me, he's all right. He's got a bit of negative detailing there at the roof. So I mean, he made it look like the roof is kind of floating a little bit. And you can see like the little gap there. Gives the illusion, right, of, of this kind of roof that's floating above the building and uh, large windows for spaciousness. Alright, that's all good. So his question in particular is how do you kind of provide some sound insulation while still keeping this open? Well, I think this is a... I don't think you really need to worry about that too much because it is, it's a problem that is particular to Minecraft. The thing is, in the real world, glass is really clear. In the real world, you don't have a problem with glass because it's just clear. You can just look through it. And if you, if you really kind of finicky, you can even make it, you know, mirrored one way so that you can see out, but they can't see in and that kind of stuff. So you can kind of have privacy, but still you can still see outwards. So in the real world, glass is actually quite versatile, and you can do a lot of things with it. 
it's only in Minecraft that glass is so, you know, opaque and that you can't really see through it. So if you, in the real world, if you want to kind of have some acoustic insulation, but still be able to see out, you just have a sheet of glass. And that's fine. And if, you, if you're really worried about sound, then just have double glazing, have two sheets of glass. And that's going to help with all of, all of that. So it, it's, a, it's a purely Minecraft problem. It's not a real world problem. So if you're thinking about architecture and wondering how to make it work, I, I don't think it's a problem. I think it's just something that exists in the game and you don't have to think about it in real life. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. Uh, how would you do it in the game? I don't. I, I guess you can't. Not with the textures looking like that, unless you want to have custom textures, right? But uh, yeah, yeah as, I, as I said, I don't think it's a big deal. Although it's interesting you put windows up here too, so you can actually see... Look at that, you can see all the way to the distance. And see the temple and see the horse and everything from these offices. This is kind of amazing. I really do like your choice of really large windows everywhere. <laughs> it's just put more windows down. And you can just... Like, it's, a, it's a great view. You're right, it is a great view. I, I agree with the large windows. Excellent decision. How do you do it in Minecraft? You can't. You kind of can't. Although to be honest, having a like being on a second story, uh, there's no there's not much acoustic insulation, but I guess the uh, you do have privacy because you can't really see up there anyway. Like if you are up there, you can lean over and look down at people if you want. But if people are down here and you're not leaning over, they can't see you up there. So there's privacy, acoustics. Yeah, the the game is not is not um, nuanced enough to really allow us to consider those things. But yeah, just just glass, glass will be fine. So the third project is the temple. Again, before we read about what he thinks, let's have a look at this. Hmm. It's a little strange. What? Why is there... So he's got these pilasters on the outside. Pilaster is when the pillar is is not detached from a wall. So it's like it's stuck to a wall. So that's a pilaster. He's got a pilaster here. And then he's got these negative details in the walls behind it. That's a little bit strange. Because it seems like... It doesn't really fit to me. I mean, it's a little odd. Maybe he will explain it. And it'll make sense afterwards. Uh... Curious patterning. I wonder if maybe that um, corners can stick out a bit more, like the, like the top of the wall there. Maybe it can stick out a bit more. I feel like it needs a horizontal line to to cap it. Like here, the horizontal line goes right across. I feel like he needs that on the side too. Maybe, maybe. So you've got water things coming out the side. Not sure what that's about. And I don't want to fly too much, but there's also stuff up beyond it uh, on the second story, which is interesting. Oh, look, he's got street signs and everything. Cool. Okay, let's see what he says about the temple. Exercise 3 is a temple. He's made a water temple. The idea of this temple is not to imitate the architecture of any existing religious buildings, but to take some elements and amalgam them together. That is so difficult. Uh, cohesively into a new identity. I'm trying to invoke a sense of ancient architecture. I note that the roof may be inspired by Middle Eastern architecture. The yellow and blue are complementary colors used sparingly to accentuate the predominantly white building meant to convey purity, typically typically associated with the religion. Well, it's associated with Western religions to an extent. It's not even that, it's mostly just the puritanical and the uh, iconoclastic religions. Look, purity, not, religion has not always been pure. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of religion, religions that are kind of really messy with a lot of gods or a lot of saints. And then a lot of and a lot of colors. So then so the purity is is only one particular type of religion. Anyway, let's not go too deeply into that. The uh, two entrances are highlighted with yellow. The visitors enter into a cozy but bright room. 
leading into a smaller and darker room. This encourages visitors to quiet down. Ah, yeah, good trick. Uh, as psychologically, the darkness has the effect of silencing people. It does. Uh, this quickly opens up into a bright, large, tall atrium that encourages the visitors to look up, eventually after appreciating the central sacred pool. The open skylight allow rain to fall into the pool. The columns on either side create a boundary of the square room. Behind the columns, there are rows of seats in light shadow designed as a place for reflection and meditation. I need to see all this. So he, the, from the way he speaks, he's designing from the inside out. So let's not judge the building from the outside. Let's judge the building from the inside, because that's what he's focused on, right? So we got a bright room. And then a smaller, darker space with a statue in here. Uh, it's meant to be darker, but the thing is, it's made out of this white material, and so it doesn't look all that dark. I wonder if the light can be controlled a bit more. Like, it's still very bright in here, is what I'm trying to say. And then, so you go from a small space, and it opens up into a large space. A large, tall space. A large, tall, well-lit space. And then there's the side areas for quiet contemplation. Right? Uh, the stairs lead to a U-shaped corridor surrounding the central atrium. From here, visitors, s s visitors see near 360-degree view angle of the town including the gardens. The suits of armors create the sense that you are being watched, promoting the feeling of reverence. It's a good trick, because you can't have small statues in the game. So, yeah, actually, the armor, the armor is a good trick. Maybe I should use that a bit more in my builds. Um, whilst I don't feel the architecture particularly odd, I wonder how others would see this building. What is your thought on the overall appearance of the building? Do you think the mixture of different architecture elements work together? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> it seems really weird, but at the same time, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes, like in the real world, sometimes people will, will appropriate other buildings. Like, for example, the Hagia Sophia was originally built as a Greek cathedral, right? And then it got turned into a Muslim mosque. When, when the when the Turks kind of conquered Constantinople and then it got turned into a museum but that's not really even a, the best example in some other buildings you have kind of constructions taking place over hundreds of years and so as they add more stuff to the complex the architectural style changes and in the end you end up with this really weird mishmash of different architectural styles so it happens in real life and it can be very interesting at least from a architecture historian perspective. I'm not sure if it actually looks good, <laughs> but it's very interesting when it happened because you can kind of see how the architecture styles have changed and then how they try to put everything together. It can be very um, interesting. So before we do that, let me just look up here. So this opens up into the sky. And then up here we have, as he said, the, uh, this is the armor. And then you can look in and you can look out. It's quite nice. It's quite nice, I like it. And then a little bit of color for highlights. And you can see the entire town. I like it. I like it. The uh, the mishmash of different architectural styles. Well, I mean, let, okay, let's, first of all, it does look much better from the inside than it does from the outside. So as, as, we, as, he, as he said, he designed from the uh, from the inside out. It does look better on the inside. The outside, it is quite odd. It is quite odd. I mean, yeah. I mean, I I, I do appreciate what you tried to do, and I think you you did a pretty good. You made a pretty good attempt. But the, the real problem is that people have expectations, right? Because we've all seen pictures of architecture. And when you when you don't follow conventions, it just seems weird. Like, it, it instinctively seems weird to people. And so it's very difficult to, 
to do this sort of thing, to have like a, a, a mix and match and have it look good. I guess the Baroque style is an interesting historical example. So if you know your architecture history, there's the ancient Greek and Roman architecture, right? And then there's, there was the, uh, the Dark Ages. And then in the Renaissance, they tried to go back and copy the old Roman and Greek buildings, which they did fairly well to a certain extent. But then after the Renaissance, there's the Baroque, where they took these architectural elements and started doing weird things with it because they were bored, I guess. And they started making these weird adjustments to the classical shapes and then turned it into Baroque, which is just all these kind of weird experimentations and alterations of, of, of what you expect to be classical architecture. And, you know, we look back at that now and say, hey, that's really interesting. But at the time, not everyone was happy about that because they're breaking rules and they're doing things that people don't expect. So I guess but I guess that, that's just one example. The same kind of stuff happens throughout history with all sorts of architecture. So whenever you, you break rules, you run the risk of having to figure out yourself how to make it look good and not having something to copy. And so then it's, it's not, it's not easy. It's not always easy. How does this look? I think there's, there might be too many bits. I think there might be too many odd bits. And that maybe, maybe if like this stuff and this stuff, was a little bit simpler, maybe that would make more sense. Like, you know, there's this bit, and then there's this bit, and then this, which is a separate sort of thing, like the... There's a lot of different patterns, is what I'm trying to say. Instead of having, like, one... Instead of having... Because, like, when you when you have a... Like, to use a metaphor, like, when you talk about music, and talk about a harmony in music, it's... There's different sounds, but the sounds echo each other or they, they follow the same pattern that's a harmony is when when different sounds kind of work together and in, in terms of architecture and in terms of art a harmonious composition visually means that you might have a number of patterns but the patterns echo each other in some way and that makes things look harmonious because it's the same theme across the different elements here it, you don't have that like you have I mean, if you, if you just consider, what do we do at the top of columns? What do we do at the top of columns? So at the top of columns here, we have this sort of thing. And then this is kind of column-like, and then we have a different sort of thing. And then at the top of this column, it's a different thing. At the top of this column is a different thing. So, so as you look around your building, every single column, or every side, has a different top to the column. So then it doesn't fit together, because there's no... There's no clear pattern. And, you know, again, it's that's not necessarily bad. It can be very interesting. But the the effect, just from looking at it, you know, without without kind of thinking too thinking too much and just looking at it, I feel like the the bits don't fit together. Is what it feels like, right? So there you go. Again, you know, I keep, I keep saying it, it can be quite interesting. I just don't know if if that's what you were aiming for. It probably isn't what you're aiming for, or maybe it is. But uh, you know, it's it's interesting. I'm not sure if I'm not sure if it works. I feel like if it, this was a real world building, eventually somebody would try to change it because it just looks uncomfortable, <laughs> and that happens in real life. You know, people renovate buildings after a while if they don't like it. Uh, what's the next exercise again? Residences. Alright, so the next one is the colors. Very muted colors, that's interesting. So, uh, Mr. Icewind Hunter, there's a few highlights. It's the Icewind, you seem to be very geometric, and you also seem to be quite conservative with your colors, maybe? And maybe a little bit conservative with your highlights? Like there's no there's no wild wacky shapes right there's no weird curves everywhere maybe a little little restrained again nothing wrong with that that's just your you know just your style right but uh, if you know that you are 
quite conservative. Maybe just for fun, let loose every now and then and try to make a, a wacky curve. Just to just to make sure you're not missing out on anything important. Alright, so I think as you can see the colors are very uh very muted. With a few highlights. I mean you <laughs> you have a better chance at selling this house than some of the ones that I designed. <laughs> the rainbow house, remember that? Okay, so he's put uh, those colors there. Let's see what he has in the other rooms. He probably has a, a concept here, like a, some sort of color scheme going on. But it's quite subtle, as you can see. And a, a similar pattern between the houses, like the, the feature color is always in the same place. It's always in the back wall of the master bedroom. Uh, he's put more lights in. That's a lot of lights. Alright, and then this side we have those colors. Oh, interesting. He's made this thing up the side of the stairs. And at the bottom of the wall there too. Interesting. So he is experimenting. You know, he's not just doing the same thing over and over again. Oh, this is, look at this. I guess this side is uh, slightly less conservative than the other side. We can see that the patterns are a bit different. Alright, what do we have here? Yeah, 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 the patterns are different on these two apartments compared to the uh, the other side of the... of the... Why? Oh, he's chosen to make that... Did he do that on purpose? Make that window smaller? Alright, let's read what he has to say about the colors. Uh, it's very conservative, very conservative, nothing crazy at all. Maybe it's good, maybe you don't want to be crazy, but um, you are not crazy. Exercise for residences, apartment complex. I must admit, compared to your attempt at the exercise, I'm definitely more conservative in my color choices. <laughs> so he knows, well I know, and he knows, so we, we are, we're on the same page here. Sorry to say you won't find any magic mushroom. <laughs> um, why? Don't you like the mushroom? I like the mushroom. The mushroom was pretty funny to me. <laughs> Fair enough. The idea is that the two buildings form an apartment complex. The strips of colors are meant to be colored panels you tend to see on modern buildings. The building on the right, when looking from the town square, has warm colors externally. Whilst the one on the left has cool colors, the panel in the middle demarcates the apartment units both from the front and the back. Uh, let me just check the back. I didn't really see the uh, the back. So no magic mushrooms for us in this uh, in this project. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, all right, other side. I see. Yeah, it's just so the so the the block of color in the middle. Divides the two apartments. Yep, good. I'll be upfront and say that the apartment units are somewhat unexciting in their colors internally. The right-hand side apartment units are based on the convention of white wall with a feature colored wall on one or two sides of the rooms. The left-hand side apartment units have wooden wall panels that have been painted white, with the rest of the wall painted a single color. Otherwise, not much else to say. Okay, well, the, it's it's not complicated, as he says. It's not complicated. We're just going to keep it simple. You know, you know, it, it's probably best. It's probably for the best. You know, if you want to sell your house, you can't have bright rainbows everywhere, <laughs> or you you have a very hard time selling your house if you have bright rainbows everywhere. So a, a very sensible approach. To, to this exercise, and I'm sure the um, the real estate agent will be quite relieved to have you picking the color scheme and not me. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know what it is. Alright, fair enough. I mean, you could have fit a rainbow in somewhere. You just hide a rainbow in a room, maybe. Maybe like in the back wall. Or like on the ceiling, just gonna hide a rainbow. Never mind. 
All right, so a much more sensible color scheme. And as he says, it's the kind of thing that you will see in some modern apartment blocks. Because, you know, because paints are, are easy, and it, it is not the... It's not, it hasn't always been the case. Like, for a long time in human history, paints were not easy. Like, back in the old days, you, you didn't really have bright colors because the materials you used to paint was, like, what, iron oxide or certain clays or, you know, lapis to make blue dye. You didn't really have green dye. And purple dye was, was kind of shellfish blood, so it's really expensive, so you can't use it. So before the, the development of synthetic paints with synthetic colors, paints were just expensive and difficult, and they didn't last very long. I, I think I said in the uh, lectures that the Greeks used to paint their temples, but it's all washed off because the paint didn't last, right? And so it's, it's only relatively recently, and by that I mean in the past hundred years or so, that bright colors in paints were viable. And so these days, if you want to add color to a building, you just paint it whatever color you like. And that seems to be quite simple. But you have to understand that historically, this hasn't been the case. So if you look at historic architecture, you just look at them and they say, well, they didn't use paint because they didn't have paint. <laughs> or they didn't have the kind of paints that we have now. So, um, so yeah, like this kind of stuff is new. Not because people didn't think about this sort of stuff. It's because they didn't have the technology, right? So yeah, in, in the kind of modern buildings, you'd see kind of patches of color and it's quite, it's not really a big deal. But I guess, you know, if you study architecture, you don't really see that very often still. You start to see it, especially in Europe. Um, or, you know, in, in a lot of places. But even, even in the past hundred years, paints don't necessarily last very long. Like the technology is still developing. And it's getting better. All right, let's let's go on. So the next one is the mausoleum. Before we let's just go and have a look before we uh, before we read about it. Did he add a second entrance up here? Did he make this bigger or okay? No, 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 no. This is not a second entrance. All right, I see. He did extend the roads back to here. Okay. And let me just check the other side. Yeah, look, the side windows. And then back the other side, alright. It's a very elaborate roof that he's made, along with a giant classical order in the front as well. So if we walk, what is it, night time? Let me just go time, set, day. Walk inside. Right, so the light filters in from above, it's very tall. It's even taller than my one. It's very tall, wow. It's very tall, so there's like a forest of columns. Very dramatic. And the light is very far away, look at that. It would be quite different in real life, because light doesn't act like this in real life. Right, light doesn't just pour straight down, there's the sun. So if this was real life, the sun would cast a, a shadow and stuff. It wouldn't be quite like this. Let's see, so the light falls onto the, the central obsidian monument there. It falls onto the the roof, like it falls on the, the top of this pediment. And then it kind of spills over, but this is dark down here. Fascinating. I don't see any... oh, there are... Okay, there are lights hidden in the ground. And he's also put... yeah, okay, he's put lights back here. So the lights are behind the columns, mostly. Alright, cool. The verticality is quite impressive, though. Yeah, just look at, look at how tall this is. Amazing. He's been looking at some cathedrals, I think. Let's see what he has to say. Exercise 5 of the mausoleum. The light in this building is shone on areas that should be seen and inspected closer. Good. Simple. I like it. The area around the obelisk is lighted to give it definition. The area above the obelisk is also lighted. Uh, also lighted. Draw the vision upwards to the... I think he's missing a word here. Also lighted to draw the vision upwards to the ceiling and skylight. I see. The side elevated walkways have holes in them to allow light from the sea lanterns below to spill above. This is appreciated at night time. Try blocking the glass blocks. 
No, I, 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 I understand. This allows the shadowed tall columns to contrast against the lighter background at any time of the day. With regard to the roof design, I tried to stay away from Gothic design because of the existing Greek columns. I guess in a way, it's inspired by the Pantheon in Paris. But distilled to a simpler design. Alright, let, let me just uh, go to night time. Time set night. Just see what he means. Is it more dramatic at night? It kind of is. It's a bit more dramatic at night than at daytime. And yeah, so the light kind of slightly filters upwards from below. Interesting. And uh, this district too. So we've got time set day. So in the dome, if we come up here, there's like there's windows at the side of the dome. Like that, it's the light there, light there, and then there's windows here. So what happens is that the light kind of filters into the inside of the dome, and so it's not that apparent here, but in real world architecture, when you have something like this, quite often the entire interior of the dome would seem to just glow because the interior is quite dark and because of the, the high contrast between the sunlight and the, and the shadow underneath. So you end up with this kind of glowing orb above you. And that's the like the inside of the dome is just this brightly glowing thing, and then it's 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 uh, it can be quite impressive. If you go to like a, a cathedral, maybe not a cathedral, like a, a classical building in real life, what's a good example? Some of the 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 Renaissance churches, I guess. I think the one in Venice. There's a lot of churches in Venice. I'm not very not being very specific, am I? Anyway, if you go to some of the Renaissance churches in Italy, uh, you you will see this effect on a on a good day where the light kind of just filters into the dome from the side windows and just kind of makes the interior glow, right? So that's kind of cool. You can't really achieve that in Minecraft. But I think that's what he's aiming for. Uh, anything else to say? Not really. Yeah, so as he said, the light... He's put specific spots of light onto, uh, onto the graves, for example, and onto the... Uh, what's it called? The memorial things? I think that's what this is supposed to be when I made them. And he said on the outside he stayed away from Gothic style of architecture, although he has made it very tall. And that's the thing with the uh, with the Renaissance is that it ended up combining Gothic architectural technology, which was this ability to build really tall stone buildings, with uh, with the classical um, design schemes. And so you end up with stuff like this. It's actually quite similar to what um, Harris has built here, which is. Uh, a classical styling, but also very tall and slender, which is what the which what the uh, the Gothic builders managed to 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 come up with in terms of kind of building technology, how to build really tall stone buildings. If you look at like Notre Dame or other Gothic cathedrals, they're really really tall, and it's just stone, right? So the Renaissance combined the the yeah the technology with the uh, the Gothic technology with the with the uh, classical styles, and and then they ended up with stuff like this. It actually is very much like this, like you know the cross, or it, it would be a church. This is a mausoleum, so a, a Renaissance church would be like this, cross shaped, with a dome, and then these really tall um, naves and uh, transepts. All right, that's cool. So the next one is the city park. Let's just walk around the park before we talk about it. Yeah, the interesting thing is, I don't know if you guys can tell, I can tell. I mean, he, he told us that he read um, the architecture book by Francis Ching. And you can kind of tell that Harris knows what he's talking about. You can tell that he's seen the drawings, he's seen the designs, and he's seen how Francis you know, described these things and explained these architecture things. And you can see that as, as Harris designs his buildings, that he's incorporating these ideas. So I can tell, because I've studied architecture. So i studied architecture, so I can tell that Harris has also done his homework, and he's done his reading, and he knows you know, a little bit about what he's talking about. And maybe it's not apparent to you guys, because you, if maybe if you haven't studied architecture, it won't be apparent to you guys. 
But you know, like as as I'm talking about Harris's designs, I can point to these real life examples because I I can see them. I can see the influence of the real world architecture in his designs. So that's great. So that's you know you just always do research. You just always learn. Hey, this is cool. Look at this a formal garden. I mean, the the thing is, the more you the more you read, and the more homework you do, then it shows. It shows in your work. It shows in your designs. And it shows when you talk about your work because you know people can tell that you know what you're talking about. Oh, look, he's put a Chinese a Chinese pagoda thing. Is this Japanese? Oh, it might be Japanese. Actually, the proportions are. Well, I mean, it's Minecraft. It's most the proportions are mostly blocky, but I think this is more Japanese than Chinese. Even this is amazing. See, he knows. Harris knows what he's doing. There's like a, a French garden on one side and like a, a Japanese garden on this side. Is that supposed to be there? I suspect this is not supposed to be here. Although there are other red blocks, maybe it is supposed to be there. Ah, uh, are these supposed to be here? I don't think they are. What is going on? Maybe he would explain them. I think that's Japanese. I'm pretty sure that's Japanese, actually. So there's like a, a French formal garden down there. There's like a Chinese garden over here. This is definitely classical. European. And uh, is there anything else? Was there a... Nope, I think that's it. It's very cool. I mean, this is just, this is interesting, right? Uh, this is... Alright, this is more Renaissance, I think. I th or it might be Islamic. Not enough squares if it is Islamic. Not sure. Not sure. I think there's slight Islamic influences, I feel like. I'll read about it pretty soon. But I can tell! I can tell! I see you! And I said, you know, you did, you did well. Like, you... If you if you if you've done your homework and you talk to somebody who knows architecture, then they can tell that you've done your homework. All right, let's read about it. So, exercise six, city park, title: Cohesive Garden. He says, whilst surveying the island, I knew that I wanted to have a central area that would lead to other parts of the garden island. I also wanted to try creating the different kinds of garden, which I knew was a tall order. Given the small size of the island, the challenge for me then was to bring them together well. I figured if the adjacent gardens were too different for a smooth transition, I could create a visual boundary by using trees. So clever. So clever. So in order to separate the different styles of gardens, because he's fit at least three different styles in here, so he, he creates visual barriers using trees so that when you just kind of look at an area, you don't see a mishmash of different styles because the other style is blocked by the trees. The central circular garden with the fountain acts as the hub to the three different gardens. The Japanese garden, the French garden, and the natural garden. The natural garden? Was it the one to the, to the left? There's also the thing over the water as well. Maybe there's like four areas or five areas. Uh, this central hub is easily reached from the bridge. From here, it's easy to explain the whole island by go by taking a tour, going anti-clockwise around the circle. Walking up the hill brings you to the pavilion. The pavilion gives a higher vantage point to view the island, but only partially shows the Japanese and, Je and French gardens, serving to invite visitors to explore further. As you exit the pavilion, the threshold and the path lines up perfectly with the distant road of the town to give it the illusion of continuity towards the horizon. Did I miss that completely? <laughs> so the central area, or the starting area, or the you know the, the, the nexus is here with the fountain. And look at that, the, the trees block the, the gardens and then the hill blocks the Chinese things. Amazing. So, oh, I see what he means. So the... Uh, so you go to the pavilion, and this gives you a nice vantage point from which you can kind of see hints of the Chinese garden on one side, of the French garden on the other. And here, this lines up with the city. Amazing. Good job. 
Um, and then going left from here takes you to the Japanese garden, which begins from the Tori Gate. True to the style of Japanese garden, I had to carefully compose the landscape, including the waterfall, river, trees, bushes, and rocks. The meditative spots to stop at are the first bridge, the second bridge, and just by the second small lantern. These are marked by red wool. Okay, so the red wool is not really supposed to be here, but it's just marking them out for us. Moving along with the wooden bridge and floating Japanese island, I mean, uh, for floating Japanese... We're missing some words. I think this is like a pagoda. Uh, brings you back to the land. Alright, so there's meditative places. And also, I, I missed this too, so... He actually carefully composed all of that, so that he made the okay. He made the waterfall. He made the bridge. Let me just remove the red wool. So this this is a point of interest, right? So we can kind of see outwards, like there's a distant thing there. This is called like borrowing scenery. So the garden itself ends here. So this is a concept in Japanese gardens. I don't know if if Hera is actually meant to do this. But, but because like Japan is a small place, relatively, and a crowded place, so the Japanese uh, landscape designers have this concept of borrowing landscape. So the garden itself ends here, but the garden is designed in such a way that the view is continuous. And so the view goes beyond the actual garden towards scenery in the distance. And that becomes incorporated into the garden because it's it's seamless. And often you would see this, you know, maybe there's a mountain in the distance, and so then the, the garden will be designed to make use of the view of the of the mountain in the distance. Right? So it's kinda like this this thing here. So that's not actually part of the garden. But you know, it, it it's it's been incorporated into it. Like it's a, it's an interesting rock because it overhangs and everything, right? So there's an interesting rock there, and it's been incorporated into the, the view. So uh, it's a, that's another very interesting trick that Harris has done. You can see he's put down these bushes, so he's very carefully sculpted this mountain into looking like a very natural thing, even though if you understand Minecraft, you'll know that Minecraft never actually creates a landscape like this. But it looks natural, so, so he's really managed to achieve... The, uh, the Japanese kind of concept of, of garden design where they they work very hard to make something look like it's just natural which is really weird and, and kind of contradictory but you know it's a uh, it's pretty amazing so then here this is the second important spot and you can kind of see that both ways is interesting so on this way you can see this composition here that's a really nice composition actually that there's a bridge so there's like kind of cross cross, so there's kind of two lines crossing each other, very interesting composition. And then from this side, you have like a, a frame, and then you look out into the distance and then this stuff. Very good. It's very, very carefully designed. And the path, of course, brings you around. The path is not straight. Like the path just winds around and around, so you can go down here, it winds around and around, So as you, and then as you kind of follow the path around, you just look at all the things because the path leads you all the way around and at, at each point there's interesting things and even here when we're borrowing scenery like that's interesting too and then we go back and we just uh, get some daylight back and then we go across this see again the the crooked bridge I don't remember if you if I talked about this, or if any of you know this. So the thing with... Um, well, there's a few things. The, the the winding bridge, there's a... It's a, it's a metaphor for, for how things are often not straightforward in life, right? In order to get from point A to point B, you have to go around. And sometimes a, a bridge will zigzag left and right instead of going straight. And, you know, partly it's to make you look at the different scenery, and partly it's a metaphor for the complexity of life as well. So it's kind of this um, merging of architecture and philosophy. And there's also... There's also uh, 
the uh, the the superstition that if uh, if an evil spirit is trying to catch you, the evil spirit is is too you know they do um aggressive to actually bother going around and so they fall in the water because they just want to go straight towards you and so it, just, it becomes a trap. Uh, it used to work on the mobs in Minecraft. It doesn't work anymore. <laughs> so before they upgraded the AI, like if a zombie was chasing you, uh, they'll just fall in the water like that, and then you'll be safe. So it doesn't work anymore. But that's uh, that's another thing. I don't know if Harris actually knows about this. He didn't write about it in his in his book. But but you know, there's a lot of philosophy in landscape design, and again. If you've done your homework, if you've read about it, if you know what you're talking about, then it it it's, it appears in your work, and people will know. People who people who know what they're talking about will know and will spot it and will understand. So this is this is really well done. Is that that's also artificial, isn't it? That wasn't there before. Yeah. So Harris has made a lot of things that weren't actually on the island. He kind of built them artificially, but made them look very natural. That's very good. That's very good. Alright, what does he say about the French part? Uh, take the right path to get to the French garden. The rows of conifer trees on either side shields the garden from being viewed from the central hub. This garden is the most colorful due to the flowers. I also had fun with the geometric patterns. Passing through the French garden leads to to the path along the coast. This area is the natural garden which has branching paths up here and a small wooden pavilion. I think it'd be good for people to jog or uh, to jog or walk they're missing words or walk around if the garden is bigger. Looking at the island from above and walking along the paths, I'm happy with the construction of the park as an exercise to bring the gardens together cohesively. Do you find that this is the case? I think so. Alright, let me just look at the, the French garden again. So, you know, very, very orderly trees. Are they identical? They are. So the trees are identical. And then there's just collections of flowers in each spot. Yeah, very geometric, very French, right? And then moving beyond the geometry, we have the natural... I don't know if it's natural. Because the paths are very prominent, so the trees there, I mean, I guess those are natural. So this, I feel like this is more like a modern, a modern park. Uh, kind of like um, Central Park in New York. It's not exactly natural, but it looks kind of naturalistic. Mostly because New York, as I said in the uh, lectures, New York is very square. And so they built the park to be not square, it's just to have some variety. And like this, this is very modern, right? They're using the the glass railings, so I feel like this is like more like the the modern modern park, more than like a natural park. Although it is, this is quite natural. There's a little bit of a pavilion here. So let me just go fly up and see what the plan of it looks like. Yeah, so there's one part, one part, and then one part on the other side, and then a fourth part. Yeah, I I I think it's really well done. I think it's really, really well done. Yeah, I think I do. I do. I think it's. I think it's really well done. Even the lights are different. Look at that. Even the lights in the different parts are different. Just to you know, highlight the uh, or to emphasize the uh, the different areas. So you know the the detailing. Matters. You can tell that Harris has been thinking about all of this stuff, even down to the light. Actually, are the paths different? I think the paths are different. So the paths are different materials and different designs. So it's iron there, right? And it's wood over there. Yeah. So so everything, the materials, the shapes, the designs, the philosophy. I mean, it's it's, it's really well done. He's done his homework, and then it shows, and then everything is 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 everything fits in place. It's it's great. A plus, A plus for the for the park definitely. So the town square is the next one. The town square is very square, like it, it's literally a square, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Although you know, subtly it kind of goes up and then down again. That's interesting. 
I mean, it's a very subtle thing, but you know, even a very shallow staircase will allow people to sit down on them. And this kind of really subtle dip into the ground means that everything is focused into the middle. And so then you can imagine people kind of just sitting around here, eating lunch, you know, coming out of the offices, having lunch in the park and enjoying the fountain and the, the pigs staring at me. And uh, it's, it's, um, it's simple, but I think it's quite effective. Some trees too. Trees are good. Let's see what he has to say. The title, Modern, Modern Square. He says, There were several requirements that I'd set for my square. First, the focus of the space would be in the center. Fair enough. Second, there would be steps so that people could... Add, could s Are we missing some words? Could sit at the square facing the center. Third, there should be grass and plants trees to make the town more green. These are good ideas. Fourth, it should be accessible from any direction. That's also good. Last, it should have a minimal vertical presence to allow an obstructed view across the square to the other side. I believe I achieved my goals well in the end. The modern looking square takes some cue from the square on Swanston Street in Melbourne, Australia. Swanston Street? I don't really remember. Um, let me just go to Google. You should do this too. I'm just going to go to Google image search and type in Swanston Street Square Melbourne. Uh, and uh, is there a, like a, a... Can we find it? On Google Maps, City Square. City Square. Can we get an address? <laughs> I don't think this is the right address. Oh, maybe it is. Maybe it is. Swanson Street Square. Oh, this one. Is it the one in front of? Uh, what is it called? It's the one next to St. Paul's Cathedral. Is that the one? Swanson Street. I'm just looking at uh, Google Maps right now. I know you can't see anything. You should probably just do that as well. Just pause the video and just type in the address. I think he mean. I think I know what which one he means. Is it the one between Collins Street and and Flinders Street? Is it that one? I think that's the one he means. All right, I know. I know that one. Uh, I started with the periphery of the rectangular space and formed the square shape in the center. This area then steps down like an inverted pyramid, allowing me to create a simple fountain that acts as a focal point while not obstructing the line of sight across the square. The form of the square is kept relatively simple. I added interesting elements by using slightly contrasting material and creating geometric patterns on the ground. As you advised in your video, keeping the town square simple is important to avoid drawing attention away from the surrounding architecture. Yes. So, you know, it's uh, it's simple and effective. I think it will work really well in real life. Although maybe... Yeah, I think for the most part. I, if it were me, I might have added a step here just so that you know if people were to sit here they have something at the back you don't really want to have your back to the road that's a bit strange you want to kind of sit against something so here so on these sides I, I like this because if you sit like here you have a back against a step which is okay and then you can look down into the square I would have had you know half a step here as well but maybe it's difficult to fit the to fit the uh, the grass into that, I don't, I'm not sure. But uh, that's 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 a pretty minor issue. That's a really minor issue. Fountain steps to sit on, and otherwise simple. Yeah, I like it. It's it's really 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 square though. If you look at it from above, is that a problem? Not really. People don't really look at things from above that much. People usually walk on the ground and not fly. I usually don't fly. Alright, good. Good. Good, it does exactly what you want it. It does exactly what you intend for it to do. Great. 
uh, it mostly it's it's intended to be under you know understated and, and not too aggressive, right? It's not supposed to be too. It's not supposed to overpower the surrounding buildings. And if you look at it, really, it provides a good backdrop. Like the the occasional tree provides a good backdrop for the uh, surrounding buildings, or you know, it provides a good um, framing for the surrounding buildings. Yeah, good. I mean, it, it fits well into the city. So the next one is the roads. He says, I have to agree with you that the spaces left for the road is simply not enough. But I believe overcoming the limitations and challenges of design is what makes architecture more interesting. Well, yeah. Roads, they always take up more space than you expect. <laughs> anyway, when I designed the modern town square, I already had in mind an older looking road to frame it. Many towns in the 18th century had red brick roads. So I wanted to bring this period's element in to give the hint that this ground or this town has been around for a while. I also liked how the modern square contrasts with the red brick road, but fit together together quite naturally. I didn't want to use red brick for the rest of the roads to make it easier for the people to find the town square. I suppose the grey roads do look boring, but I'm fine with it because the buildings should take centre stage. All right, good philosophy. Building the roads up the hills were tricky because I didn't want to make them look like stairs. The angle of the steep had, has to be small enough that a wheeled vehicle could travel on the road. The only exception to this is the bridge to the city park, but I suppose vehicles are not meant to get it into the park. In front of the mausoleum, there is a no-through road sign with a circle that allows vehicles to turn around. You may notice unfinished roads as you travel further away from the square. I intend to continue building this town beyond the exercises you've set up. Cool. Alright, good. I'm, I'm interested to hear what you come up with later on, although it's not easy to keep expanding a town and then to keep it coherent. But I'd be interested to see, to see how it goes. So the roads, he says, are quite simple. So red brick around the town square for the highlights. That doesn't really... this is not part of it. Red brick around the town square, it's a... interesting, interesting contrast. Yeah, it does It does contrast quite interestingly, although, yeah, it does contrast quite interestingly with the square and with the other buildings around it. It's the only time that you've ever used red brick too. And then the side roads are stone bricks to the, to the park. And also stone bricks out here, I believe. Alright, stone bricks out here. And yeah, red bricks in the middle. Otherwise, fairly simple, fairly straightforward. Uh, grass edges to the roads, turning backwards. All right, that's a dead end. Hmm. I think there's potential for more stuff to be done with the roads. Although it's a it's a difficult thing to to suggest because you know as 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 he said and as I un I understand, it is very easy to to overdo things, you know, to try to do too much and end up with a, a mess. But it feels like we can use a few more decorative things around the roads. But you know, it's not it's not terrible. It's not bad. It's just maybe not quite as uh, as interesting as as it could be. Interesting. Uh, White stone boundaries. Uh, what's it called again? The quartz. Quartz boundaries. So Harris has kept both the uh, the roads and the town square quite simple, just to just in deference to the uh, to the architecture. All right. Well, the next thing we're going to go into is go into is that one. And he spent a lot of time on this. I can tell. I can tell. A lot of time has been spent on the monument. Let's just go all the way back to the town square because you can see this from the distance. And in fact, it's completely lit up as well, so it doesn't really matter if it's nighttime. Uh, let's let us just swap these books out. You can see it all the way from here. All right, so exercise nine is the transition, and he calls it the platform garden. It's like a 
giant terrace, right? After giving the monument project much thought, I decided on building a hanging garden. I knew that a large that a large scale of the build would be necessary for the dramatic effect. It is large, I agree. It is also dramatic, I agree. I had an image of the hanging garden being relatively tall, but not very towering. From the direct front approach, the platform garden appears relatively small, and the larger hanging garden itself seems to sit on this platform. This is the illusion I tried to create. As you approach this platform garden closer, more of the hanging garden is being concealed, building up tension. As you reach the top of either stairs, the release of this anticipation comes full blast as you almost see the entirety of the hanging garden, made possible by the flatness of this area with open space. The straight walk towards the arch, the entrance into the garden, is almost painfully long. Designed as a secondary gradual tension that is again released as you pass through the arch at the top of the middle stairs into the hanging garden proper. I must say the floor plan of this flat platform is inspired by the square in front of the Taj Mahal, clearly seen by the long middle pool adjoined by paths on either side. Oh, fair enough, if it's good you can copy it, why not? The whole architecture of the garden is somewhat Islamic. The white pattern on the grass is Islamic geometric pattern, which is better appreciated from a higher vantage point. Probably like when you go into the hanging garden and look back out, you see it. Uh, the platform is held up by repeating columns and arches. This rhythm is continued into the hanging garden proper, making them appear as one. Sounds great. Alright, let's, let's walk up. So as we go towards here, so you can see this towering thing in the distance. It's, it towers above the clouds. That's really dramatic. <laughs> this thing towering above the clouds. But as you get closer, you lose sight of it, right? And then, and then this front view becomes dominant. That's a moat? You have a moat around the whole thing as well? Oh no, it's just around the front, I see. So there's a, there's a moat around the front. But this is important too, because it creates a, a threshold. You know, it, it, it demarcates outside and inside. And so now we're inside. And then it's, it's completely blocked. Yep, I see it. So now it's completely blocked. And uh, uh, in Islamic culture, there's this ritual of washing. Before you go into a mosque, for example, you always kind of wash your hands. I think you wash your feet too before you go into the, uh, the mosque. I mean, it's just good general cleanliness, of course. But also there's a... There's a you know, there's a there's a psychological and philosophical statement of you know leaving the the dust outside or leaving your the, the dirty things outside and then going in clean, right? So there's there's not just I mean there's hygiene and then there's also the, the psychological and philosophical thing that that's going on. And then you come in here and bam, wow, hey, because we don't see that you don't. We didn't see this part of the hanging garden from the ground. And it's very different. Yeah, Harris is right. Harris is, is completely right because, you know, out here, it looks like this. Even here, it looks like this. And you don't, you don't see the terrace. You don't see the garden on top of the stairs until you reach here and then bam. It's like, just a completely different world because you don't see any of this until this point. So even though the path is, is quite straightforward and it's, it's not that, you know, it's not, there's no, there's no walls, right? There's no, there's no doors, but just the elevation and coming up the stairs and then seeing this, like this is completely, it, it feels like it's just a completely different world from the stuff outside. Partly, you know, because we haven't seen this before. Partly because it's completely flat, whereas outside everything there's hills. There's light here. There's no light out here. You know, there's patterns on the ground of flowers. There's none of that outside. So, so yeah. So once you once you cross the threshold of the staircase, the the entire the entire garden kind of just hits you at the same time. It's just one open space, and and it's and it's large. So then it's just like a, you just, you, it's like you enter a different world somehow because everything is different. Everything is different from, from what you came in from. That is cool. Very effective. 
highly, highly effective. This is actually water, let's not go in there. Yeah, like, like it's just completely different from the rest of the town. So... So you just feel it. And there's a second terrace after it, look at that, I can see it. So there's the uh, giant waterfall, that's cool. And then there's that, that's, that's cool too. It's just big, you know? <laughs> this is just... Sometimes you just need to make it big. Hey, this is great, look at that. The stairs go up and the arches go up, but at a different angle. Look at the detailing. So interesting. It's so interesting. And then a second terrace. Again, completely different from what we, what we see earlier. It's just, you know, as you step up, I mean, sometimes you, you see architecture or you read architecture books and you see like terraces and you're like, why did they bother doing that? But the thing about, what's great about Minecraft is that you can just build it and then walk through it. If you look at a picture of this, you might not understand how it feels. But now that we're walking through this thing, like you go up a staircase, a terrace, up another staircase, another terrace, up another staircase, another terrace. Every time you go up to the next level, it's a different world. It feels like it's just a different thing. You, know, you go from one place from one place to a different place to a different place every time you go up and it's it's just amazing. It's just amazing. Uh, is this the monument? This, this <laughs> the transition is completely seamless, so I can't tell where the where the uh, where the where the actual garden ends. I think I think this is the actual monument. Alright, let me just stay here. And we'll read about the monument. Should we walk? Actually, should we walk through first, or should we read about it first? Let me just read about it first. All right, monument. It's a hanging garden. He said. <laughs> he says, "I severely underestimated the amount of work and time this project took." Well, now you know. <laughs> now you know, and that is that is not surprising. If you've never built a giant project before, you just don't know how much time it takes. But now you know. So going forward, if you want to make a giant project, you know how much work it's going to take you. <laughs> well, that's all right. Well, good. Mission accomplished. We're done. That's basically why I, I put this exercise here, monuments. Because you, un until you do it, you don't know. Uh, I already had the scale in mind, but the design of the repeating columns interspaced with decorative arches made the project almost impossible to build by a single person, because each module takes a long time to create block by block. Yeah, because you use a lot of different materials, and 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 you have to, and everything's different. <laughs> it took me weeks to finish this agonizing project. I, you know what? Good job. I, I, I actually I applaud I applaud the effort you put in and it's amazing. The final result is amazing. So I hope it I hope you think it's worth it. I think it's worth it. But I didn't do it. I hope you think it's worth it. But it you know, you have to you have to put in the work to get the amazing monument. Uh I almost gave up many times, but then I remember you said if it were easy it wouldn't be impressive. Yeah, I, I did I say that? I mean it. I, I meant it. If it were easy, it wouldn't be impressive. And it is very impressive, so it's not easy. I can tell. In the real world, this project would not be environmentally friendly despite the trees and plants, because pumping all the water to the top of the building only to flow down decoratively is just pure waste. I knew this project is something out of a fantasy world, and I aimed for an ancient-looking structure. Knowing that there will be trees which are relatively dark in color, I went for... I went... Oh, I think he meant sandstone here. We're missing words. I went for sandstone with a splash of lapis lazuli blue. I also think the light colors give the hang gardens a floaty feeling, in contrast to darker material that would likely give the structure the quality of heaviness and stability, e.g. the mausoleum. True. I mean, the like, it's just... It does. I mean, it's, it's the same thing as the Taj Mahal because like, the Taj Mahal is this, it's this pure white building. And so it just seems completely out of this world because 
you never see that sort of thing. And that that's part of what makes it so impressive. The light color, the size, of course, and, and the light colors and everything else, and the, and the detailing. So it just makes it seem completely out of this world. Due to the limitations of Minecraft, creating the details of the wall, especially the decorative arches, require three to four layers of blocks. While not very space efficient, they do give an interesting dimensionality that shifts as you look at them from different angles. As for the actual construction, I started with the two-story high base platform, added a smaller third-story platform on top of it, then built the indoor garden complex. I added the short aqueducts later. The platforms outside have footpaths and several features, e.g. pavilions and fountains, to break the monotony. So much detail. It's amazing. I restrained myself from building too much outside as I think the flora and water should be the main features. I am, I am happy with the aqueducts, but am a bit disappointed that you can't really see the water flowing along. I am suddenly aware that in real life, aqueduct water were never meant to be showcased. Yeah, that's true. Like, you see the aqueduct, you don't see the water. The indoor garden complex was extremely challenging because I had several ideas that I wanted to cram in the small space I have available. These include a central circular dais, complex stairways that look like mazes. Wow, are you serious? Complex staircases that look like mazes? I... I... really? Big columns, trees, and waterfalls. I extended the indoor garden vertically downward to take advantage of the space below, which appears to reinforce the floaty illusion. We haven't been inside yet, but it sounds amazing already. The large trees in the middle receives its light and rainwater from the open circular skylight. The skylight is extended upwards with columns stacked on a circular wall to make the indoor garden appear taller. There's a temptation to allow visitors access to higher levels, but I finally decided to make them unreachable by foot. As they look up from the low levels, the angle elongates the building vertically. I hope the height inspires all. I'm sure it does. I would have liked more space to put railings on the stairs and plant more trees. I know I whinged about the very scale of the, this project earlier, but I can't help but wish I had built the platforms outside wider to allow more space for the indoor garden complex. Around the back of this monument is another stairway leading down to the ground level. I'll link this to the roads as I expand the town. I was probably overambitious with this project. Whilst I had fun designing something I've never done before, it quickly became a chore after a while. I'm not sure I want to build anything of this scale in the future. Well, you say this now, but over time, eventually you start thinking, man, that was amazing. That's the other thing I built. I want to build something like that. Like you, it's, it's this, this sort of thing, like big projects are like this. Like you build something amazing. You say, I'm never going to do that again. And then after a, a while, you think back and you say, I'm going to do something even more amazing. <laughs> and then you do it. And it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it just gets completely out of control. <laughs> it, but it, it's great. I, I I think you I think you responded perfectly to the exercise to the challenge. You uh, when you started off overestimating or underestimating this thing, but you finished it. That's what counts. That's what counts. Like you if you start something doesn't mean really, anyone can start something, but finishing it shows dedication. And that's the real proof, right? So he talks about how these things takes like three yeah, so there's like so the, the detailing on the walls is four blocks deep. There's one, two, three, four blocks. Five, if you count uh, that bit there. To, to create this, this pattern on the walls. It's so complex and it's all different materials. It's great. I mean, I'm sure it's a lot of work, but it's, it's amazing. I mean, let's walk around the whole thing. Let's just walk in. So there's a terrace. And he says around here, so there's the aqueducts up there. And then there's trees and fountains, he says. So it's just, yeah, all right, good, amazing. Yeah, there's, there's the fountains there. There's the trees there. And you can look out if you want, but why would you? Because this stuff is more amazing in here. And you can walk around the whole thing, and there's more staircases to the next terrace. And then there's this fountains. Oh, this is like a little pavilion. All right, yeah, you talked about pavilions. Trees, fountains, pavilions, bridges, water, aqueducts, and everything else. 
Although you kind of see water here, why don't you have the water flowing out of here as well? Never mind. Let's just let, let, let's not. Since he put in so much work to make this, let's just you know sit on every chair and walk every path because we want to do justice to the amount of work that Harris put into this, right? And he says that back here he's gonna build more city. I don't know if you really wanna. I mean, you know, if you if you continue building the city, it's just gonna be more and more work. <laughs> Maybe you feel like you need to build a city big enough to uh, to be worthy of this monument, and then it's just gonna be another big project. <laughs> okay, no, no, do it, do it. You know what? If you want to do it, do it. Do not let anyone discourage you from doing amazing things. You know what I mean? Don't let anyone tell you to not do amazing things. How about that? Alright, so we went around the first terrace, and it's amazing. And look at the patterns, everything just fits together. The modules, like the walls, the modules, everything just kind of fits together. He worked out the math, he counted the blocks, he worked out the modules, and he, he stuck to the materials, and everything looks good. He, he picked basically two colors. Like it's just, white and yellow is pretty close, and then there's the blue highlight, and then there's the green and the tree. So he stuck to the the color palette. Oh, there's the interior. All right, so let, let's walk around the second terrace, or is this the third? Do we count the garden out front? Oh, let's look back at the garden out front. Can we actually do that? Kind of. Oh, you can't really get a top-down view. You can kind of see it. But yeah, we're in a different place now. Let's not worry about that too much. So the second story, similarly, yeah, fountains, pavilions, seats. This is amazing. I can see the staircases inside. That's amazing. <laughs> Why on earth would you... Staircases that cross through the space like a maze? I'm I'm just I'm just I'm amazed that you would be audacious enough to try that. <laughs> but you know what? Good good for you. I'm glad that you're the one who's doing it and not me. You can you can see it on the inside. <laughs> brave. It's, it's a brave thing to attempt. All right, so we went around the, the second terrace. And then there's this. Does it go all the way down? It goes all the way back down again. Wow. So you get to here. A central fountain. Alright, so the staircases go up and down in all directions. And you can't actually get to the top. Is this as high as we can go? We can go up there as well. Alright, so you come in the middle. You go down the sides. Can we go down? We can go down. Let's go up first. So you can go over here. Wow. Insane. This is amazing. Amazing. The other side's the same, right? Yeah, so it's symmetrical on either side. You can kind of parkour your way around here maybe. Oh I wanna now I wanna make this parkourable. We just need to um, have some platforms. Maybe like jump around pillars. Then never mind. Don't do that. Okay, so this is this is up. So going down, we go back down to this level, which is what? What is that? Like the the first terrace now? The first terrace level. And then we go all the way around. Fountains. Amazing! And then go all the way down to the middle. And there's a massive tower in the middle. Amazing! And that's it. The whole thing. Wow. Well, yeah, oh, yeah, well, yeah. You, you, you did the work and, uh, I can, I can see. I can see that it took several weeks. I can tell.
And、uh, I'm not gonna let anyone tell you that this is not amazing because it's amazing. Can I fly? All right, let me just break some rules and fly, and see what it looks like up here. I mean, this is amazing. This is amazing. This is amazing. But you're not allowed to come up here. All right, so from up here, you can see that too. So these are the things that people will never be able to see if they don't fly. Although in the real world, you can probably fit a staircase up here somehow. Maybe like hide a ladder, hide a ladder in the columns, or something. You can probably do that in the real world. Amazing. All right, I just want to hang out here for like several hours, but I won't do that because I want to. You know, I don't want to drag this video out for several hours more. But maybe you should just download this map. Any anyone watching, just download this map and hang out here for a few hours, because it's amazing. Look at that. Okay, so the final exercise is to clean up. Clean up mostly, uh, just kind of thinking about what you did, reflecting on your learnings. Uh, exercise eleven, clean up. I wrote all these notes when I went back to the previous exercises to critically evaluate my work. So they are my reflections on what I liked and what I didn't like. All right, that's important. Reflecting is important because that's how you learn. If you don't think, how do you learn, right? So you have to think about what you've done to decide how to do things better. Most of the changes I made to the previous exercises were minor and cosmetic. Surprisingly, they were more elimination than addition to the architecture. The several times I tried to add things just to see how things could have. Been usually ended up being destroyed again, reverted back to their original form. I completely learned. I suddenly learned how to stop tinkering. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, as as you design, you'll get to a point where if you add more stuff, it makes it worse. Then you stop. <laughs> so you you figure that out. <laughs> I like to give you. I I like to give my big thanks to you, Simon, for taking the, the time to create the Archimine one hundred lecture. An exercise series. It certainly liberated my design ability by allowing me to experiment, doing different and new things. You are welcome. That was the intent, and I am so glad that that's exactly how it worked out. The, the the intent of these exercises is to make sure you try things and quite possibly try things you've never done before, and in doing so, you learn new things. Because you only learn new things if you do new things. And so this is like a an an excuse or an encouragement for you to do new things, and and I'm glad that it worked out for both of us. In addition to this, I learned a lot about using different materials for builds, effective use of light and shadow to create drama, direct attention, and conceal elements of less importance. How to design gardens as well as the different types. Your garden was amazing. You did really well with your city park. Ah,、uh, the space required to build roads, they and and how much fun they can be to build. Being better at estimating the amount of time and effort required in building a project, how to use shapes, forms, colors, lighting, scale, etc., to subconsciously convey an idea to the people experiencing the buildings through their senses. That is so important because, you know, architecture. There's the functional aspect, like you know, a kitchen has to be a kitchen. Right, a garage has to be a garage. So there's the functional aspect of it, but beyond that, it, there's also the art. And art is about communication. If you look at a painting, it's like they want to show you something. If you read a book, obviously you, they want to tell you something. If you watch a movie, they're trying to tell you something. And and there's that in architecture too. So when you you look at a building, the building wants to tell you something. A, a temple wants to tell you something about、uh, sacredness, right? Or a, a a palace wants to tell you something about opulence and wealth and power, or a library wants to tell you something about learning, or you know, or any anything like a garden wants to tell you something about relaxation and nature, and so, you know, it it it's the 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 architecture want is is about conveying things as well as just the purely functional aspects. So how to use shapes, forms, colors, lighting, and scale. To communicate concepts to people, 
is, is important in architecture. And then finally, again, it's been a privilege. Thank you. Hope to see the next architecture course from you. You're welcome, and thank you for sharing your work. And thank you for spending so many weeks making the monument. <laughs> um, I don't actually know if there will be a next architecture course because I can't think of anything to, to do. Like, I, I mean, I've, I've gone through the basics, which is a good start. What would I want to teach next? I'm not sure. Anyway, I'll think about it. I, I'll think about it. I do want to do more. And, and, and mostly because, you know, you tell me that it's been so helpful for you. Uh, all right, we'll end this here. And if you are working on your exercises, then, you know, if, if your monument is less impressive than this, that's fine. That's, that's no problem. Uh, send it in when you're, when you're done. Or, like, I, I do ask you and urge you to send in your, your exercises when you're done because it's always it's always useful to see other people's ideas and it's always helpful to just see more things and learn more things by seeing more things. Alright, I'll stop rambling here and hopefully I'll get more submissions because these are, these are very interesting. Alright, I'll see you.